So uh, this is uh, uh, aging is, as you can see right here, it's an incredibly popular topic. Uh, and that's because uh, even if you are not interested in aging, aging is interested in you. <laughs> So uh, I thought what I thought I would do is take you on a grand tour of aging on the planet Earth. And uh, we'll start way back and we'll end up today. And I'll do my best to connect these ideas to your lived experience, um, to the virtues and to the concerns that animate aging in our culture. Uh, today. Does that sound fair to you? No. Yeah. All right, well, let's, let's do it. The first thing you have to know uh, to really understand aging is to understand that on this planet, to the best of our knowledge, sex and death entered the picture at exactly the same time. <laughs> Early on, some people would say for billions of years, uh, the only form of reproduction that took place on planet Earth was asexual reproduction, where one very simple cell would divide into two identical copies of itself. And in, in many ways, you can think of this in a, 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 sort of a kind of immortality for the individual. Because here's an individual cell, and now look, two copies of exactly the same cell. Now, a few differences, there were some changes in the genome, but the point was the individual cell di didn't have to die. It could divide into its own offspring, become its own children. Later, there were very, very simple forms of algae that could divide into two. They were multicellular. But the big bang came when life on Earth began to reproduce sexually. And when that happened, the door slammed shut for the parents. <laughs> there was no way out <coughs> except death. So if you've ever said to your kids, you'll be the death of me. <laughs> That, they're like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I studied biology. So th the point here is that we now, in this, you know, again, we're talking billions of years ago, we now have a, 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 a life span that we can understand with two points on the end of a continuum, birth and death. So what, what's going on inside that lifespan? Well, for almost all of human, or excuse me, world history, what happened is that lifespan had one part. It was called maturation. And we've all watched National Geographics. We've all seen the videos of the mama bear and the two cute little cubs. <laughs> And then the mama bear takes care of the little cubs, and then it's time for the little cubs to go away, and she chases them away, and they're like, I don't want to go away. <laughs> You've all seen this, right? It's very scientific. But, but the point was, there was one phase of life, birth to maturation, and maturation included reproduction. Death followed hard on the moment a creature began to lose any bit of its vitality or capacity. And again, if you watch these videos, I can guarantee you never saw a gray zebra. <laughs> there was never a geriatric giraffe going, oh man. <laughs> if an animal in the wild can't run quite as fast as it used to, it becomes lunch for somebody else, right? Now, this will really bake your noodle. There's one exception to this rule on this planet. On this entire planet, there's one creature that has discovered 
the virtues hidden inside the necessity of aging. We call ourselves homo sapiens, <coughs> but we should really call ourselves homo geros, man the old. It is the discovery and exploration of aging that made us human. Of the three great discoveries of humankind, I'll say, fire, the wheel, and aging. Aging is the most important. Now, how? How did we discover aging? And, and how did aging change us? And for that, I'd like to take you back to some point in time I don't know how long ago. I can say it was probably, not definitely, but probably on the plains of Africa. And if I could take you with me now to a dark night on those plains. Imagine the stillness of grass. Imagine a small group of very, very early human beings clustered around their little fire. Imagine the noises made by the predators not too far away. And you and I sneak up close. And as we get close, we hear the sound of a little girl crying. And then we get closer and we see a woman pick up the little girl and hold her. And we see that woman give the little girl something to eat. And we come to understand that this girl is crying because she's hungry. And she's hungry because this was the day her mother gave birth to another child. And the delivery was difficult. And the mother lost blood. And she didn't have the strength to go out and gather food for her daughter. And there we are, witnessing the creation of the planet's first grandmother. <laughs> the woman who picked up the little girl was the mother of the mother of that baby. And for the first time on the planet, Two generations came together to nurture and strengthen and protect the young. Now again, we'll go back to our National Geographic specials. In all cases with mammals, uh, what we see are is very, in, in, again, I'm, there's always exceptions, but in many ways we can say that mammals invented parenting. Okay? There are certain parenting behaviors in non-mammals, uh, in, but l let me just say, uh, mammals are anatomically designed for parenting, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so the, the genius leap that took human beings made them, in a sense, different from all other mammals was that they discovered that these older, this older generation could also be recruited into the care of the young. And so grandparenting was discovered. And grandparenting gave advantages to our species that other species didn't have. I'll run through them very quickly. They're kind of interesting to me. Um, first off, let's say, uh, well, let's start with lifespan. Our closest relative in terms of DNA on this planet, our closest relative is the chimpanzee. Depends on how you count it. About 95% of our DNA is the same as chimpanzee DNA. Now, 
It's, I'm really thankful for that 5%. <laughs> because if I was trying to talk to you and that other 5% was not there, you'd all be running around like a bunch of monkeys. And you'll be picking uh, lice out of each other's hair. And how would I get you to pay attention? So this 5% has a lot to do with our humanity. Now, one of the things we know about biology is that very closely related organisms have very closely related lifespans. Does this make sense? Yep. Maximum lifespan for a lion. How long? Eight years. Four years. About 22 years. Maximum lifespan for a tiger. 22. 22 years. <laughs> It goes like this. If you look at closely related species, they have very similar lifespans. So let's take chimpanzees and humans. <clears throat> Maximum lifespan for a human? Maximum. Maximum. 110. Maybe 115, 110. Uh, certainly in the one t 110s, there, uh, there might only be a, at any given time a handful out of 7 billion people. Uh, who are like 114 plus, something like that. So in that range. <clears throat> so that's the maximum lifespan for uh, humans. Maximum lifespan for chimpanzees? 26 years. 40. 35. Well, 60. One of the really sad things about chimpanzees is by the time they get their AARP card, <laughs> the end is near. <coughs> so 55, some people would say 55, in certain conditions in captivity it might be 60, but, but basically the, the maximum lifespan of a chimpanzee is half that of a human and 95% of the DNA is the same. What about epigenetics? What does that make you? It makes you a freak. Mm -hmm. And the freakish thing about you is how well you age. One more thing about this, all of the extra lifespan comes after reproductive maturity. So a, a chimpanzee female becomes fertile at around the age 12 to 14. The average chimpanzee female has about 40 years of fertility. Okay? And the average, or the, 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 the chimpanzee female can be uh, is still fertile very near the end of the lifespan. Okay. So, what we see is that our lifespan has been expanded because we found a virtue in this stage of life we call aging, that we call aging. A couple of things about grandparenting. I just, because I think there may be some grandparents in the room. Uh, first thing. First thing, I just, since I'm a physician and a geriatrician, I'm just going to tell you, I'm giving you all a special license for spoiling. Uh, you are actually supposed to spoil the grandchildren. It's good for them. And uh, I won't go into the studies, but there have actually been studies done with rat uh, uh, subjects. Rats. <laughs> Little rug rats. No, these are actual rats. And... These rats, uh, if you uh, spoil them when they're young, their offspring are bigger and stronger and more curious. Mm. So their offspring are bigger and stronger and more rat. curious. Uh, how do you spoil a rat? Uh, uh, <laughs> the, the answer is exactly the same as the grandkid. Uh, handling, a lot of handling, a lot of petting, a lot of cooing and talking and that that has an impact on that rat's offspring. Second thing, and this is pretty fascinating, um, the men in the audience may not actually believe this, but it is a published study. So, if your mother-in-law lives with you, <laughs> your wife will be more fertile <laughs> than if she isn't. It's true. Because she runs to your bed constantly. <laughs> <laughs> So the, re we don't, the reason people think this is true is that in the household, there's that two generations supporting the young, and it is easier to have a larger number of children at, than the opposite. So back to the chimpanzees, a really crazy chimpanzee female 
would have five offspring in a lifetime. They nurse for six years because uh, too rapid uh, reproduction is really dangerous for them. Humans, of course, nurse for much less than that and can have many more children, hence uh, seven billion humans and a few hundred thousand chimpanzees. But back in the hunter-gatherer stage, and when we were in the early studies yes. of uh, Bushmen and stuff, there was about a five-year in birth interval. Yes. So the thing that uh, has happened, as we've gotten better and better at exploiting age, we've been better and better at getting births closer together. Doesn't it have something to do also with the fact that you're would staying you still in agriculture? Yes, I will. I'm sorry? I think it also has a whole lot to do with better being better stationary. Yeah. Because you're not carrying the kids, right? And because of agriculture. <coughs> so the question is being made: What what about the, the the changes that came into humanity in terms of st st non uh, uh, nomadic lifestyle and the development of agriculture? Beyond the scope of this conversation, but I think there's really strong evidence that suggests that development of aging gave us access to local, deep <coughs> local experience that made a uh, settled lifestyle uh, more possible for us. So, and that actually, thank you for saying that because it brings me to the next piece of the puzzle, which is I, I talked about the biology of grandparenting, but that's not all there is. There's also a cultural dimension to aging. What happened is this idea of a grandparent in many, many, many cultures around the world became generalized into the concept of an elder. Many, not all, many cultures around the world distinguish a life phase following adulthood. Now, as saying that in American English sounds weird. Life beyond adulthood. Who can even imagine it? Our culture says you turned 18, you became an adult, and that's it. And sometimes we'll signify older people by calling them older adults. The seniors, I really hate that one. We'll come back to the, the word seniors. So, older adults. And so, in many cultures around the world and through history, there has been an, a passage into adulthood and a passage out of adulthood. And elders around the world and through history have often been gifted with certain obligations and certain freedoms and certain uh, opportunities to behave very differently than adults. In fact, one of the reasons our society is so wacko is that we are living in a world governed by adults without elder supervision. <laughs> now, if you think children without, uh, without adult supervision is bad, adults without elder su supervision, way more dangerous. They can do a lot more harm than kids. Yes. So, so, so let's now, let's go back and let's look at some of the roots of aging in culture. And let's see how other societies in other places have handled some of this. And I'll, I'll actually, I'll start with the ancient Greeks. There's other places we can start, but we'll start with the ancient Greeks. And I'm going to tell you a little story uh, that comes from Greek mythology to help you understand how long human beings have used culture to make sense of aging and explain it. You ready? Yep. You up for this? <laughs> I don't know if anyone saw her this morning, but the goddess Eos made a, an appearance. Anybody see her? The goddess of the dawn. Uh, here we are on Aurora Street. That was actually her Latin name. Uh, so this is her. We're living on her street. Um, so Aurora Eos. 
the goddess of the dawn, said by the Greeks to be one of the most beautiful of all the Greek goddesses, and I will tell you also mother of the four winds. So, sister of the moon, we'll get to that in a minute. So, Eos, beautiful, Eos, very reliable, very reliable. Every morning, up at dawn, obviously, and she would light the earth before her brother, the sun, came uh, up into the sky. That's, that's when you see her. So, Eos... I said, beautiful, reliable, one quirky, weird thing about her. She had an eye for mortal men. Now, personally, I think this is because she was made up by mortal men. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I think it came from, actually. But in the story, <clears throat> every day she'd be looking down like, Woo! Hot! <laughs> oh, I was good looking. And one morning, just as she was bringing the light of day to the city of Troy, a young Trojan prince walked out onto the walls of the city, stretching, you know, getting ready for the day. And she saw him, and she's like, Woo, yeah! That's the one I want right there. She fell in love right there. Well, that was a problem. Because if you want to talk about a mixed marriage, <laughs> immortal goddess, mortal man, that's kind of a problem. So, Eos goes up Mount Olympus, goes to see Zeus, tells Zeus she's in love, and, and says to Zeus, will you make Tithonus immortal? And he says, no. And now, I told you, very reliable, very persistent. Eos won't let up on Zeus. Oh, again and again. Oh, come on, you got to make him immortal. Until finally, even the patience of Zeus is worn down. <laughs> and he says, okay, fine. Fine, he's immortal. Get, get out of here. Next morning. And again, you got to try, you got to try to imagine your day starting this way. Tithonus is laying in bed. Of course, the dawn of the day is coming. He wakes up, and there in his room is the Greek god of the dawn. Okay, so right there, that's a pretty good start. <laughs> then she leans over the bed, and she goes, Tithonus, I'm Eos, and I love you. And he hasn't even gotten out of bed yet. <laughs> then she's like, and I, I want you to come with me and live with me in my palace in the east. Okay. And then the kicker, I went to Zeus, I asked him to make you immortal, and he did. Tithonus gets out of bed, goes to the palace in the east. Say what you want about Greek goddesses, she was right. They were a beautiful couple, they loved each other. And there in her palace, Tith uh, Tithonus dined on nectar and ambrosia and was protected from all harm. Then one day, when Eos was getting up to go to work, <laughs> uh, she bent over her beloved Tithonus and kissed him and noticed a gray hair. <laughs> she did not she didn't think much of that at first but pretty soon there was a lot of gray in the hair and then Tithonus went totally gray and he got old and then he got older and older and older and he got older than any person had ever gotten before. And then he got older and older and older. And those big arms, those big strong arms, they shriveled up. And that big voice yeah, faded. And then he got older. <laughs> and at last, 
his beloved Eos took pity on him and turned him into a grasshopper. <laughs> and that's where grasshoppers come from. <laughs> so you're getting a little science in here. <laughs> that's where grasshoppers come from. So, so Eos and Tithonus, that's the that story that I just told. The story is, you know, depends on who's counting exactly. Uh, it's probably four or five thousand years old. And uh, why why has it survived? What, what were the Greeks saying when they were tell the story? What were they, they saying? They were saying, to live is to age. And not even the power of Zeus can break the link of the human being between living and aging. So Zeus did have the power to make Pythonus immortal, but could not spare him from aging, because aging was part of what it meant to be a human being. He was a, a man, not a god. So in ancient Greek times, people struggled to understand what is the meaning of this. We, we experience aging on an extremely personal level. We feel, we encounter pain, limitation in mobility, changes in vision, changes in our hearing. All of this is experienced in an acutely personal way. But the fact of it, the fact of our aging, is a distinctively human phenomenon. And this is the most important thing I'm going to say to you this morning. Remember this thing. Aging comes from inside of you. Right. It is you. It does not come from outside of you. It is not done to you. It is you fulfilling your own human destiny. And the ancient Greeks understood that. And they used their mythology to explain that. And I, I'm going to tie that story of Tithonus to uh, a, a, a little bit of an insight from the Midrash uh, writings uh, associated with Judaism. Um, the early rabbis asked the question, why did Adam live so long? And actually, if you want to know my opinion, I think Eve lived longer. They just didn't want to write it down. <laughs> uh, but anyway, why did Adam live so long? And the answer of these early writers was, it was necessary for Adam to live 938 years because there were no elders. And uh, the writers, uh, these Midrash writers, talk about this. What does it mean uh, to be made, Adam and Eve were made, and to, not, to be an adult and to have not had a childhood? <laughs> Let's let's go one, you know, peel it back one more. Not only did Adam and Eve not have parents, hmm. they had no grandparents. <clears throat> and they didn't know how to live because there had been no elders to teach them how to live. And so much of the writing about this in this topic really focuses on the fact that elders are agents of cultural transmission. You thought it was about the cookies. <laughs> yeah. It's about teaching young people, this is how our people live. That is the duty of the elders and the grandparents to, to transmit Culture. So you go back to Adam and Eve, and you realize that Adam and Eve had uh, no parents and no grandparents, and had no no uh, 
received understanding of culture, okay? And so you can sort of imagine when Cain and Abel were complaining to their parents, you don't understand! Actually, no, they didn't understand. <laughs> uh, they had, couldn't say, when I was a kid, they were never kids. So these writers suggest that what was happening was that uh, basically <clears throat> Adam and Eve had to stay around for a long, long time to be the elders. And I just want you to think about, you know, when he was 925 and he was going to the bar mitzvah of his great, 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 grandson. You know, finally, at last, the job was done. Adam died and there was a human culture that could carry on. That's the idea. But I'm, 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 what I'm doing is showing you that this thread of understanding of aging is even woven into the early stories out of the biblical tradition because people had to make sense out of this. Hmm. And the way we make sense of aging is through our culture. And um, there's... Uh, I have a little... Um, I'm going to shift, even though I would love to talk to you about the Middle Ages. <laughs> yeah. I, would I would love that. But Me too. I'm going to shift to the modern day <coughs> because I'd like to take the work we've done together up to this point and apply it to how we live now, to American culture, to our society, to our municipality, uh, to, the lives, to the lives we live. So... I, I said that culture is the instrument that allows us to give meaning to aging. Without meaning, aging is simply suffering. Okay? If you take the meaning of aging away from us, it's all aches and pains and limitations and losses. And what our culture has done, and I'll show you how this has been accomplished, <clears throat> what our culture has done is stripped a great deal of aging of its meaning, its worth, and its standing, and left there bare and exposed the true, actual, and factual difficulties of age. And I'm, as I said earlier, I'm a geriatrician. I will stand up with anybody here and say, I know quite a bit about the difficulties, the diseases, the disability, the dementia. I, I know about this. The problem in American culture is that, that those difficulties are left to stand bare naked in the public square. They become objects of shame and ridicule. And anyone with two neurons to rub together an American society will do everything in their power to avoid the appearance of age, if at all possible. <laughs> our culture and our society sanctions people when they exhibit the, 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 any outward visible sign. Um, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll give you a quick example of this and something you can do about it, okay? This is practical advice as well. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm wondering if anybody in the audience has ever had a moment in conversation where you were thinking of a word <laughs> or a name. <laughs> There's a couple of young people in the audience and they're like, <laughs> there's a there's a moment where you're trying to recall the word and the conversation stops <laughs> and uh, neurologists they have a fancy name for this but the, the common name they use for this is the tip of the tongue phenomenon <laughs> in other words I, <laughs> what so in our culture and in our society this is a stigmatizing event. And in our culture and our society, the person experiencing it tries to push the stigma away 
almost always with humor. Uh, joking about it. Oh, senior moment. <laughs> and this, this pushing away of this, we'll come back to why this happens, but actually is really well known. There's a author named Samuel Johnson, a lot of you know him, uh, from, <laughs> lived in the 1700s. He wrote, I think it was, I can't remember the year, but he wrote that no, I cannot remember the year. <laughs> and you know what's great? I don't okay. need to. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> he wrote that um, when, upon entering company, uh, <clears throat> an old man uh, lays his hat down and then uh, readies to go and forgets where his hat is, people say, oh, <clears throat> he must be losing his memory. He must be going. His memory is going. But if a young man mislays his hat, nothing is said. So here we are, back to the senior moment. <clears throat> so it turns out people don't like this, and they feel like it, it, it is reflects badly on them. I'm going to turn it around for you, and we're going to talk about a little bit of neuroscience. turns out that young people um, <clears throat> are really good at recalling numbers, words, and uh, names, and that when you put them in the, uh, a functional uh, MRI scanner and you ask them to do that, what happens is you can see part, a part of the brain when you say, you know, recall the, uh, this address in Niagara Falls, they recall it, a very specific area in the brain lights up. So it's as if <clears throat> they've got all these big filing cabinets that are mostly empty. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and when you say, what's that address in Niagara Falls? They're like, yeah, got it right here. <laughs> Those of us who've lived a number of decades, however, when you put them in the scanner and you ask them to recall the address in Niagara Falls, well, that reminds me of, and, and the, the, a lot of the brain lights up, because that address isn't stored in one place in a big empty filing cabinet. It's stored in five different places. And so in order for you to recall that name, you actually have to activate more of your brain than a younger person. <coughs> now, you might think that that would be a bad thing, but it's not. There, for a long time, the tests and research that was done uh, on the brains of older people all had to do with how terrible older people were compared to young people. But there's some really exciting research, and I won't, I won't go into the details of it, exciting research from people who are studying how older people kick younger people's butts <laughs> mentally. I'll start with this idea. All, if you tell a group of older people and a group of younger people a story, a little, a little quick little story, and then you ask them, what's the gist of the story? Gist, G-I-S-T. <laughs> the young people will give you back the facts pretty accurately and the older people will give you the essence of the narrative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The essence of the They word. do it narrative. much better than young people. Young people are actually quite limited in that regard. <laughs> uh, and I say that based on how they perform on these tests. Second thing, if you take young people and old people and you show them a series of numbers, Young people are much better than old people at picking out a pattern and saying, oh, here's the pattern. I think you do it pretty quickly. Old people are very good, much better than young people, at knowing when there is no pattern. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no, there's no, <laughs> they, young uh, people, they're, they're so <coughs> quick and they're so agile that they jump so fast to see things often that are not there. <laughs> Lastly, and um, this isn't so much research as human experience, um, let me contrast adults and elders in this regard. 
let's imagine let's imagine an old woman, a grandmother, a great grandmother, and a young woman. The young woman is in love. She brings the boy home, meets the family, meets the matriarch, this old woman. This old woman knows right away he's trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and she's sitting there and they're visiting and she's like, oh my, this is going to end badly. <laughs> but she doesn't say that. <laughs> and the young woman goes away and there's heartbreak. And the young woman comes back to her grandma, great grandma. And the grandma holds her and she cries. The young woman cries. And the old woman doesn't say, I told you, I told I told you so. You. <laughs> the reason? She knows that guy. He broke her heart 50 years ago. <laughs> He's seen it all. And when she was an adult, she would have said, eh, Tony's no good, get away from him. <laughs> when she's an elder, she knows that things have their season and have their way, and that grief is a part of life. Mm -hmm. Now, last thing I want to say about what aging gives us, and then I'll wrap up on uh, about culture. How are we doing on time? <laughs> okay, we got a little time. So, um, <clears throat> So what are the gifts of aging that's very hard won, but extremely valuable, is the loss of the illusion of immortality. <laughs> so when we are young, we are girded or, or we're shrouded by a belief that the amount of time remaining to us is infinite that there are no limitations. There's no point in the future where we will not be there and we will not be us. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so, <clears throat> as we get older, um, and there are some people in this room who could confirm this, but as we get older, we start to do a strange little kind of math. Whoa, wait, wait a minute. By the time this mortgage gets done, I'll be 96. I'm, I actually might not be here then. Um, and so gradually there's a dawning of awareness that people, uh, people begin to understand that they won't, they're not a permanent feature of the planet. That there, there'll be a time when the I ceases to exist. Now, after that, uh, it's not my field. I don't know anything about it. Uh, I don't know. But I will talk to up till that point, because that is my field. Um, up to that point, uh, what happens is, and my practice over the years was really focused mainly on very old people, very frail people, and very poor people. Uh, those are the people I spent most of my time taking care of. And um, one of my favorite conversations, uh, really enjoyable and enriching, is in practice getting to know a new patient, understanding a, a little bit about them, and then having this conversation. I'm probably the last doctor you're ever going to have. <laughs> and the person will go, I thought that, yes. How do you want to die? <laughs> and I have found over and over and over again, when I kick the door open in that way and have a jolly conversation about what do you want, what do you not want, how do you want to roll when you're dying? The, the, it comes out like a volcano. Because the culture says you're, you're not allowed to lose this illusion of immortality. You're supposed to be afraid all the time. And I, I've actually met a, quite a number of people who are not afraid of death at all. Very hard concept for young people to even imagine. 
and that this freedom this this loss of the illusion of immortality this acceptance of temporality the temporariness of the I is actually the great gift <clears throat> that humans have used for millennia to cool the passions of adulthood to gentle the frenzies of the adults and to calm our culture from its worst excesses. Not always effective, not always working, but that's how it worked. So I said earlier about you know elders supervising adults. We actually have a deeper problem in our culture is that we are we have largely erased the authentic power of the human being who understands that he or she will not always be here. That is a problem for us because without that taking the edge off our excesses we're prone to do things like burn up all the carbon on the planet. Right. For example. Yeah. Drill until everything's gone. Pollute all the water. Because we believe, we uh, 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 our culture has adopted this illusion of immortality that is a, a characteristic of youth. And here's where I'll try to bring it together for you. Aging is experienced as a personal phenomenon, but it's actually a cultural reality. And the aging we experience is defined not so much by biology, but by culture. The old age we inhabit in American society was made by young people. It was made in the image of the young. And so we say in American society, <coughs> youth is best. Contrary to all experience, <laughs> that the pictures that go on the magazines or on the television are of young people. That we lionize the achievements of the young. <coughs> And older people are instructed in the craft of deceit. I'll give you an example of this deceit. An older person retires from full-time paid employment. Okay? That's the language we use for that. If you run into that person six months later, they will, he or she will say to you, Oh my goodness, I'm so busy. I have no idea how busy I would be. I'm so busy. I have so much busyness <laughs> that you cannot possibly imagine how busy I am. <laughs> and this person, again, is making a very adept cultural move to say, don't you even think I'm in the club, even though I'm not going to work every day, I'm in the club. I'm super busy. <laughs> and we equate value to that busyness. We equate value to what, how much you can produce and how fast you can produce it. And in doing so, we create a cult of adulthood. This cult of adulthood has some similarities, some similar characteristics with the cult of domesticity from the 19th century. Anybody remember the cult of domesticity? Mm -hmm. yeah. If you ever heard the words, a woman's place is in the home. <laughs> that was the cult of domesticity. <laughs> Women were to be excluded from the public domain and were to exercise their influence only in the private domain. So uh, <clears throat> the cult of domesticity was enforced by men, but also by Women. women. And women who deviated from it were very severely sanctioned. Okay? So it is with the cult of adulthood. People who violate the tenets of the cult of adulthood are sanctioned. And so some of the biggest enforcers of the cult of adulthood are older people. 
some of the most ageist people you will ever meet on this planet live in continuing care retirement communities. And they say things like, I don't want her in the dining room because she's using a walker. That's right. That's right. Oh, some of you don't know this yet. Yes. Uh, you will discover this, yes. So, so that's the cult of adulthood speaking. It's a corruption of our historic valued elderhood in which older people are flayed with the expectations of being faster, better, and more their entire life. There's no escape. There's no way out. Older people are told you have to be independent no matter what. <laughs> Fail to be independent and we will disappear you. <laughs> you will disappear into the old age archipelago and no one will ever see you again. Now think about those stakes and what that kind of be what behavior that brings up. At the very same time, young people are placed into situations where they are tested, graded, and evaluated as if they were mini adults. <laughs> and they are judged as, by that standard, and when they're found lacking, it's their fault, not the culture's. So <clears throat> a lot of my work, this I guess the topic, the of the lecture was changing aging, I think, or second wind or something like that. Um, but a lot of my work, yes, this is good. Uh, a lot of my work is helping sustain a new cultural narrative. Um, and I'll tell you one last quick, a new cultural narrative. Thank you. You're welcome, ma'am. So, uh, I, I'm going to tell you about a little adventure I had last year where I was really blessed with the opportunity to go on tour uh, with Samite. Anyone know Samite? Yeah. yeah. With Samite and Nate Richardson and uh, uh, a, bunch, a bunch of really great people, uh, artists. And we put on a uh, two-act non-fiction theater piece where uh, I actually performed on stage wearing two foot tall stilts uh, and very nice pair of long pants. <laughs> and the point I was making with my two foot long stilts was, what if, what if we human beings kept growing on the outside while we were growing on the inside? What if we had a special section in this room for the elders because they were all eight foot tall? <laughs> and what if you were to stand there on a street corner and look up at a 90 year old woman like this? And what if she looked down at you like this? <laughs> so I'm gonna leave you with one small thing you can do to help me change the culture of aging. There is a very pernicious, very nasty, very dirty five-letter word which I'm going to share with you, which I, I'd like you to consider the possibility of not using this word anymore. Okay? That word is still. S T I L L. Still. And here's how we use this word we use the word to signify older people who are worthy and to distinguish worthy older people from unworthy older people. And, yes. If you, if you go to a social gathering and you're together with people and people are talking about their families, you're going to play the game, the still game. And somebody's going to say to you, yeah, you know, geez, you know, my Uncle Fred, he's 84, and he still, <laughs> still drives. <laughs> <laughs> but this is 
is America, and that's never good enough. Somebody has a grandma. She's 90. She still, still drives to work every day. <laughs> <laughs> Then, of course, of course somebody has a great-granddad, 96, just got back from climbing K2. <laughs> He's in Florida now, because he yeah. loves to water ski. <laughs> Barefoot. <laughs> In the new. <laughs> so this is how we tell each other who is worthy and who is not worthy. And we take the yardstick of adulthood and we use it to measure elders. And they are found wanting. But the fault lies not in the elder. The fault lies in the yardstick. So, one thing you can do, going forward, this point forward date, listen for that nasty word. If you choose, try not to use it. If you have the opportunity, Share a little bit about what you heard this morning with people. Because that's how the culture changes. It changes when we as a people uh, begin to tell ourselves new stories about who we are. So I uh, agreed when we started that I would have some time to take questions. And I have about 13 minutes uh, <laughs> for questions. Well, you think it's still Correct. remaining. Yes, yeah, still <laughs> remaining. Can I intervene a second? And, oh, yes. And uh, there may be some people that have to go downstairs okay, for the hospitality. Uh, we have a service at 1030, and anyone here is welcome to join us. But I also wanted to thank Liz Einstein for uh, encouraging us to have a series of talks and to invite uh, Dr. Thomas to kick this off. And he's already hit on many, if not most of the, not all of the topics uh, that we're going to have. The next one is Liz Kendall on February 1st. And She's great. Liz is going to talk about the Eden Alternative. And Dr. <coughs> this is one of Dr. Thomas's early initiatives. On, uh, wow, cool. That's great. Yeah. 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 Uh, and we would love to have you come back uh, later in the spring for the conclusion of it. Thank you. person has inspired our uh, our series so we welcome you back and thank you if we can we can have you um, so thanking Liz also there is uh, these little brochures on the table over there and we're passing around a sheet to sign up if you'd like to be in touch by email um, please find the paper we don't have enough paper to write on the back but communicate with us and dr. Thomas has agreed to take questions now thank you very much and I, I, I'm sure all of us want to applaud him and I wanted to also mention this. Uh, so I, I wrote a book uh, called Second Wind. And if, if any of the things I was talking about today seem of interest to you, this book would explore them in more depth than you could do in a short uh, public lecture. Uh, will you tell people about the elevator? Oh, yes, there's an elevator over here you can go down. Um, we tried to encourage everybody to come in over there because if you get into this part of the building, you <laughs> So anybody who has to leave, please uh, go quietly. Well, thank you. That didn't sound right, did it? Yeah, <laughs> go quietly. Okay, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll do a couple of questions, and then I know everybody's got cool stuff happening, so I'll repeat the question. Okay. 
Okay, I'm wondering, in terms of our society fragmenting, mm -hmm. in terms of communities and people mm -hmm. moving and all yes. this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. if what we haven't done is institutionalize those who need help, both our children in uh -huh. schools yeah. and our elders into nursery, nursing homes and whatever. So the, the comment and question is, uh, in, in our society, in many ways, we've had fragmentation, and in place of really cultural answers to problems, We've created institutional answers to problems, and e young people and old people are especially at risk for institutionalization. And if I may add to that, um, uh, in the past, aging was largely a, a, a familial and tribal affair. And in the future, aging will happen in the presence of people you are not related to and who don't belong to your tribe. That's good news. That can be a better, richer, deeper experience than when you must rely simply and only on family and tribe. We have the opportunity to create intentional <laughs> communities that uh, can support us in new ways. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, sort of connected to that, uh, have you in your travels or, or readings examples of cultures where um, we can look to for inspiration? Um, the question is, what what cultures can we look to for inspiration? And um, my the work that I do uh, related to aging keeps me almost uh, keeps me entirely in what we call the first world. So I don't have expertise or knowledge to talk about tribal <coughs> solutions. So in the first world, the most impressive cultures are the Scandinavian mm -hmm. cultures. Mm -hmm. They've done the best job at uh, meeting the needs of older people in community uh, without institutionalizing. Uh, and it's a very significant commitment in those cultures. Uh, I've been most impressed uh, by, uh, in particular, Denmark and Sweden. Hmm. Do they keep them at home? So people, so the question about being at home. Um, it turns out that in a society where people have multiple humane, engaging solutions to the problem of loneliness, People are not terrified of leaving their own private dwelling and move more easily <coughs> to other environments. American culture says mm -hmm. you live, age in place, and live in your home until right. you fall off the cliff. Mm -hmm. In other societies, there's a more graduated approach with more options for people. Yes, ma'am? I just wonder how many people here have grandchildren living near enough to see them more than once or twice a year. Like grandchildren close by. So now look at this. So so here's, thank you, here's what I would say. Um, grandparenting was always familial and according to DNA and family. I think we're going to see the rise of a new kind of grandparenting Mm -hmm. where people are grandparenting young people they're not related to biologically. Because th you are th this grandparenting, okay, you thought puberty was bad. The, the impulse to grandparent is very strong in your DNA. <laughs> uh, and so if you don't have little biological subjects to practice on, you can practice on other people's children. One more question. Oh, yeah, Michael. So the the great grandfather continuing to drive. Can you model a little bit of language to help us? Yes, great. I, I, I should have done that. Thank you, Michael. So I was talking about the problem with the word still. Uh, it turns out any sentence in which the word still is being used in an offensive manner 
you could take the word out and the sentence means the same thing without the derogatory uh, implication. So, my Uncle Fred is 86. He drives. Yeah. My uh, granddad, you know, 94, he runs his own law practice, whatever it is. The, we, the still is intended to enforce orthodoxy. It's intended to separate the worthy from the unworthy. So what we can do is use exactly the same language, the same words, remove the epithet, and in doing so, communicate that all people are worthy of respect. It doesn't matter how well they are or are not emulating the behavior of a 40-year-old person. So, I, I just got one more and then we'll go. Thank you for all your information. <clears throat> but in your own words, you, you say you look at it from the first world. Yes. I, I've passed it for 25 years of ministry, one world of life systems. Yeah. You know, it's very myopic. You're looking at one side of the house. Yes. And then still is used against African Americans in a multicultural society. And uh, an African American man's uh, life expectancy is about 10 years yep. lower. Yep. And I think you really need to either get a first on the whole picture in Ooh. making your presentation or realize the deficiency when you go back to Greek culture. And I've been a Peace Corps volunteer in Senegal where an ill person is never left alone. A child is carried on a woman's back for almost two years after nursing, and you find the peacefulness, the contentment. And I live with elders in a village where these models that we have to artificially make because of the uh, denial that we're talking about, you know, exist naturally and communally and socially. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I, you had a great, you had great projection. I'll just say. Can you condense yes, it? Yes, I'll, I'll do my best to condense it. And correct me if I'm, if I'm not correct. Uh, you know, my perspective as I stand here and talk to you reflects a certain worldview that doesn't include lots of other experiences. True. From my point of view, it's important for me to limit my remarks to things that I know and understand and for me not to speculate on other truths that I have no experience with. So uh, thank you for raising that and acknowledging that. The second thing, uh, and the comment was made, tribal cultures can do, can meet some of these really deep, authentic needs in ways that our culture has a hard time doing. However, and I will say this because I do know this to be true, if you were given a choice tomorrow to leave our society and become a member of a tribal culture, you would not do it. I would. Well, you would. <laughs> but if you look at if you look at net migration from the U.S. to tribal cultures in the third world. <laughs> one world, sir. One world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me just say, net migration from industrial economies. <laughs> okay with mass consumer society, which is what we're occupying, to a more traditional cultures, if you look at that, it's vanishingly small. <laughs> Thankfully, we have an example here. Uh, thank you. But on the other hand, what we have to do, the, those of us living here in this world, we've got to figure out how to meet those challenges and change the aging that was handed to us and make it something new. Thank you very much. Thank you.